Welcome, everybody. Nice to see you all. Uh, part 12 of the Benny Gesundheit series, the Innovative Creative Series, to heal him like you've never learned it before. And it's a pleasure to welcome back Rabbi Dr. Benny and Vakasha. Thank you very much. Pleasure to start every show. And thanks, thanks for a lot of people who share their thoughts and suggestions for improvement. I appreciate that very much. It's not an easy experience to teach online when I actually don't see and don't know the knowledge. Sometimes things might be too difficult or so I'm very happy and appreciate all the feedback. So here is the topic for today. I would like to talk today about Mismo Ein Bet, the last Mismo of King David. It's not really true. It says at the end of the Mismo, Kolut Filot David Ben Yishai. That is the end of all the Mismorim of David Ben Yishai. Now I'm back. So talking about Kolut Filot David Ben Yishai causes a real, real problem at the end of chapter 72, at the end of the second David collection, at the end of the second book. Kalut Filot David Ben Yishai, that's the end of David's prayers. But we know that in the next book, he continues to be mentioned. How should we understand that? And I would like to focus today in lecture 12 on the second collection of David, which is closing with 72. There's a beautiful structure. We discussed it last time. We will continue a little bit on that. It is a midrash of the story in Shmuel Bet, where the sin, his sin with Bathsheba is mentioned. And we will compare briefly, we will compare the first and second collection, which has a beautiful insight. I would like to focus on the Mismo Ein Bet, the structure and the contextuality and intertextuality, which is extremely, extremely rich, interesting and informative. So let's think for, let's review the two first books. The two first books, as you see in our, uh, the most important graphic summary of the entire book, you see here the first Osef collection in the first Sefer, and we called it D1. It talks about his philosophical insights. We discussed that in many shiurs, the different levels, how, the, uh, how King David grows religiously and how he faces the evil world and how he decides to be a better person. That's on the personal level. D2 describes his activity as a king, the public activity. It starts with chapter 51, when Natan came to him and rebuked him for his chet. And it closes with 72, which we will read today. So his political career does not start that he killed Goliath, it does not start how he got king. It starts with his ethical qualities, qualifications. And that's a wonderful insight. The king is not remembered for the wars and for the buildings, for the pyramids and for the Ark of Titus. He is remembered for his straight behavior after the head. That is King David, King David's second collection. With that, it comes to an end. Kolut Filot David Ben Yishai. True. He is surrounded, that we discussed, by the, the singers in the temple. He wanted to build the temple. He brought the ark to Jerusalem, where the temple will be built by his son. And when he walked, when he died, they continued to build and they continued to sing. That is the third book. And the third book brings actually the first temple period to a closing. We will discuss afterwards in more detail what happens after King David's end of his life. He starts quite an interesting career after his death. He starts David Melech Israel, who, was, uh, who died uh, uh, at chapter 72. He has a great career in the following chapters. And as you see here, he comes back in the blue color. You see the background. I start again. Chapter 86, there is another Mizmor, Tfilah David, one. And there are other two Mizmorim in the, th in the fourth book. 
and there are three mizmorim at the beginning of the fifth, and five at the beginning, uh, and five late, and four later on, and at the end there are eight. All together, eighteen. If we calculate one, two, three, four, eight, it's exactly eighteen. And just be easier to remember it. David Melech Yisrael Chai the Kayam Chai is the memor is the numerical value. Gimatria eighteen. He continues to have an impact on Am Yisrael. That's exactly what we learn in many Mizmorim, by that in many Sifrei Tanach, Yeshayahu, Yirmiyahu, Yechezkel, and Treyasar, we know that King David after his death is mentioned. I think that is one of the most important insights which we see here in the slide that prevented from most scholars and Parshanim to recognize the structure of Sefer Tehili. Because if he dies, he is dead. And if it says that's the end of King David in chapter 72, King David's life is over. gone. But that's not true. He continues his afterlife, not in his person, in his biography. He continues in his uh, lifetime. He continues a very active impact on Am Yisrael as a living idea, as a agada, a living agada as a prophetic person, uh, and he continues that later on. That's his legacy. So we have a clear uh, change in 72, his life as a philosopher and as a king, and when he gives over his, uh, his kingdom to his son, Lishlomo, Elohim Mishpatech then we will see. But it doesn't mean that after his death, he has no influence anymore. He continues to have an influence. We discussed in the first lecture, in slide seven to 10, uh, there's a whole collection about all the psukim, how David continues. I don't like to copy paste and repeat these issues. You can read it there if you want to remember. So David HaMelech is an ongoing person, he has an ongoing life in Nebuah and in the tradition of the Bible after his death. He starts the second period. I repeat it here briefly to show how this growth was seen in the first chapter, and now the second in, in the first book, sorry, and in the second and third book, we have a beautiful, amazing structure. David is in the middle as a king here, and he is surrounded, I will show it in another slide soon, he is surrounded by the singers. What does that mean he is surrounded? The singers surround him, but if I pass Kivyachol, Kwazi, I come to the temple where David never, never lived. The temple was not built until he died. But Ke'ilu, as if he is alive, I walk in to the temple. And who do I see first? I see first the singers. I come closer to the idea of the temple of King David, where he, where he never was present. But he's mentally, spiritually is present. And when, he, when I leave King David, I start not only my thoughts after having seen Kivyachol King David, I start also historically the time when King David historically is not alive anymore. How do I continue? What is the take home message for the person who visits the Beit HaMikdash when he walks out? What does he take home from this experience? That is what we see in the third book. So we understand now much better why this split is done and why he is surrendered, surrounded by 12 Levim before and afterwards. That's the way they were singing. And we spoke about that in a previous slide, in a, in a previous uh, lecture. I want to point out an interesting hypothesis, which I feel is a good point. It makes sense that we have an introduction to the entire book, the prologue to the entire Sefer Telim is more Aleph Bet. They talk about King David, that they talk about the, the person of a Talmud Chacham, Ashrei Ha'ish, and the second chapter talks about the king who protects Am Yisrael and Zion against all the other nations, all the enemies, and helps all the nations to be worshippers of Hashem. That's what we read in the first books. If we look now at the, pro, at the prologue, prologue at the beginning of the entire book, it is Hello. very much that the first chapter correlates to the first book, 
King David as a philosopher, as a Jewish Torah person. We then talked Torah. yesterday. I'm doing fine, except for the problem. Uh, that you can can just right off the phone. Uh, can you mute, mute? Mute, please. Thank you. And the second chapter is actually King David's uh, role as a king, as we see in chapter two. So that is a beautiful, I think, well uh, intended structure of the first and second King David collection and the first and second Mismo, which is like a table of content and Hakol al Makomo Yavo de Shalom. We will talk about that book three and four later below. Let's go back now to the structure of the second collection of King David from 51 to uh, 72. We discussed the source of the Voil of Natan Hanavi Kasher Baal Batsheva is in Shmuel. And we discussed that when Natan came to King David and he told him the, the, the analogy of the, of the, there were two men in one city and the rich man had, a, had flocks and herds and the other one had only nothing, only a little lamb. And this mashal was presented by Natan to David. And David said, this man is guilty. When Natan told him, you are this man, he told him right away, uh, here, Natan says, that David says to Natan, Chatati Hashem. But beforehand, Natan said, you are the man. What you did was this misbehavior, this avera. I elected you as a king, says Hashem. And I saved you from King David. And I gave you all this honor and the kingdom. And more and more, why did you kill Uriah? Why did you do adultery with uh, uh, Bathsheba? Think about your past. So we discussed last time that that fits very much of the Baal Shuva at the end when, he, when Shlomo was born and he was called Yedidia, the friend of God. That's the happy end. But here beforehand, I quoted the Rambam. I want to quote here the idea, think about yourself. He doesn't tell him only you killed Oriah and you, you, uh, you, you made <clears throat> adultery with, uh, with uh, Bathsheba. It's your past. You are the king. You were chosen. So by, have, by telling him what remembered the past, he tells him much more than only the sin now. Your, your whole history is endangered. Your whole history is not justified with the avera which you did now. Think backwards. It's a request of retrospection, of introspection. And this slide is taken from another slide on my website on Jewish uh, medical ethics. You will see it in a moment, which goes back to the Rambam, a beautiful section in Hilchot Shuva on the Shofar where he says the idea of the Ramba of the Shofar, as you see here, goes back, it's an idea to wake, people should wake up. And what should they understand? They should understand, Habitu When the Rambam quotes Tshuva, he quotes a Pasuk in Sefer, Yirmiyahu. But here he has a special term, Habitu Lenafshotechem. This term, Habitu Lenafshotechem, means you cannot change your behavior if you don't understand yourself. You have to understand yourself. Once that happens, you can turn the Habitu Leheitivu, the same letters. You can improve it if you understand what happened. Beautiful insight by the Rambam which is elaborated by Ravi Eliyahu Avihad. And here is the website below where I discuss these concepts in the Rambam. That's exactly what happens with David when he starts his tshuva process. He doesn't talk only about Bathsheba and Uriah. He remembers, how did I start my whole career to be a king? And, th and therefore the next chapter discusses what happened at the very beginning, chapter 52, which also starts, David and Navi, we'll see it in a moment with the same term. So if in chapter 50, Asaf told him a good man has to make a, a nether, to, to make a, a wows in order to improve his behavior, 
That's what we see in chapter 51 to, to, to 72. Four times the idea of nether is mentioned because David has to change his behavior and he has to make sure that what he does will make an impact. And he has to commit to that after his sin. Look here at chapter Samach Aleph. Ki ata Elohim shamata lenedarai. Natata Yerushat yirei shmecha. I did my nedarim. I made my, my, my uh, wives. I, and I pay for them now. I committed to something. And he says that's the job of a king. Yamim al yamei melech tosiv. Ushenotav. Uh, that's the only way he can continue. He can establish a future. That's a, a consequence of chapter 50. And here we see it again that he has a nether. I want to show you now three, four examples of how the second collection flows in this idea is that I made a mistake. I have to remember where I came from my fights with, uh, with uh, Shaul, and I was saved to be a king in order to make an impact as a king for Am Yisrael. That's the growth along, uh, along the second collection. In chapter 63, at the very end, he says, The king should rejoice in God. In chapter 64, in the last pasuk, it says, no, not only the king. It's not only the king who should enjoy and be successful. If the king is successful, it's in order that every other righteous person, he will also rejoice. That is a typical feature of the second collection. If I do something, King David, if I survive, I do survive in order to lead others in this, in my footsteps, or another pasuk, which points that out very clearly, two psukim, lam natzeach al shushan edut nichtam le David lelamed. He makes a mizmor to teach. This mizmor has to be taught. That's the only mizmor in Sefer Tehilim that the mizmor is written to be taught. Of course, all the mizmorim are taught. I wouldn't have a course. We wouldn't have a course. On, on 30 uh, uh, presentations, if not every mismore is valuable and appropriate to be taught. Why this one? Because here David understands, if I was saved, I'm an example for others, I'm a role model, and they should follow me. And that's exactly a typical feature of, this, of, the, of the second collection. And he tells them very clearly, am, <laughs> Trust in him all times. O oh, people, he talks to the people. He wants to educate. That's exactly collection two. So to summarize that, we saw that briefly last time. We have at the beginning, and once it was, Natan came to rebuke him. And when he came to Batsheva, that is the sin. And right afterwards, we have exactly the same wording. Why is that? So most commentators say that it's not connected because one is in the, when he was a king, when he was at the top of his uh, career as a king. And the, and the David is when he was early on, before he was king, when Shaul was king. So there is no chronological flow. That is true. Of course, there is no chronological flow. But if the King David remembers his past based on the instruction of Natan, remember where you came from. Hashem saved you from Shaul. The natural flow is after the Chet, he remembers what happened when he was saved from Shaul. So the flow between 51 and 52 is very logic, not chronologic but very, very logic. There is an introspection. He, think, he starts to think where he started. These are the four maskelimis morim, afterwards al tashchet, and afterwards le David, he is singing, and we, we spoke about that, al tashlicheinu, don't throw me away from you because of the chet, and at the end, al tashlicheinu, don't uh, leave me alone, the same word only twice in the Bible, 
is exactly the framework of the second collection. Furthermore, we have here eight biographical notes. What you see here, it is A time X. Here we have a biographical note. It happened when David, when King David ran away from Shaul or when he had a war or when he was hiding. That is very biographical. His, his way, his career, the history of his career. That fits very well what Natan told him to do. We have two Mizmorim at the beginning and at the end, which are quoting, uh, quoting the first book. Chapter 53 quotes 14, and we spoke about the difference. And chapter 70 quotes 40 with minor changes. Why? It's not a mistake and the copy and uh, uh, doppelganger, just the double text. No, it says a beautiful message. King David at the top of his career as a king, when he was a top leader and he had to prove himself in his quality as a king, he remembers what he studied when he was, a, uh, when he was learning Torah in the first book. So he takes two Mizmorim from the first books, from the first book, he repeats them, adjusts them with a very clear intention why these changes were made. And he repeats them in the second book to tell you what I learned as a philosopher, I will apply as a king. If, if there is a similarity and an and a overlap, his kingdom is good because he's a philosopher. His philosophy is good because he brings them to kingdom. That is a beautiful insight with a lot of Mithoshim and the researcher missed totally the intention of this repetition. And we saw also that chapter 50 uh, dictates what will happen in the books afterwards. A very interesting observation is that in chapter 66 and 67, in the title, we have the four Mizmorim of Shir, as we see here. Four times Shir is mentioned, Le David Shir in 65 and in 68. Interestingly enough, in 66 and 67, it's missing. And the message is beautiful. Because here, if at the beginning, David was very personal, what happened to him when he escaped from King David and how he was successful as a king and how he, was, how he survived and how he was successful as a king, here he starts to sing, to sing. It's the victory. But if he really sings the victory in chapter 66 and 67, he disconnects it from his personal story. It's not me. It's not about me. It's about the world. If the world is in a good shape, because that was my intention to do a tikkun haolam, so just forget about myself, King David. He talks to himself. I brought the world to the place, even don't mention my name at the beginning. So I think even the lack of these two Mizmorim not mentioning David has a very strong message. At the end of the collection, we hear a king who is old. 71, and David is like a person you go to visit people in an old age home and they tell you about their life and their childhood and the, the career and the family. They have a lot of memories and reflect on their life. That's what we see in chapter 69 to the end. And when he is old, he repeats what he learned in, 70, um, what he learned in chapter 40. No. He repeats what Hi. he learned in chapter 40. Yeah. And, and he appoints to be his follower afterwards. It's chapter 72, what we will see in the moment. I want to show you later, and that is something which a lot of analogies have to prove it. We don't have time, but I would like to give you the idea and the, and the uh, recommendation to check that. A lot what he says to his son, is his life experience, which he summarizes in chapter 69, 70, and 71. What I did and what was important in my life, as he reflects on that as an old man, is exactly what he wants to give over to his son when he should be the future king and continue his legacy. So these analogies are very, very meaningful and very beautiful. What I will show here later. So let's now take a look where is 72 located, not only within the collection of 70 of David collection two, 
He is surrounded, as we said, by Asaf before and by Asaf afterwards. And by Bnei Korach, sorry, afterwards. Here, 50, we show 50 prepared uh, chapter Mizmor Nun Aleph. We discussed that last week. And we showed that the ending of chapter 50, Zoveach Toda Yechabdaneti, Vesam Derech Ereve Yesha Elohim, that he will continue. That is what 50 said. David actually uh, realized that. Here is the end of King David's life, Kalut Filot David Ben Yishai. Here end the prayers of David, the son of Yishai. That comes to an end. Asaf, who was such a great stimulation for King David, he continues to sing after King David's life. And we will discuss that in the next Jiru in lecture uh, uh, 13. Asaf was an example for King David, collection two. And he came only in one chapter here because it was enough to show how King David is an example. And he continues to uh, encourage and to lead Amisrael after the time, at the time after King David. We will look at that later on. I want to show that the end of chapter 72, the end of King David is really the beginning, like a springboard, the beginning that King David keeps living, keeps on living in the, in the awareness of Am Yisrael. We will look briefly at chapter 86 and others later on. Now what I would like to do is to read Mizmo Ein Bet. Lishlomo, Elohim mishpatecha lemelech ten v'tzitkatecha leven melech. Yadin namcha betzedek v'aniecha b'mishpat. Yisuharim shalom la'am u'gvaot b'tzedaka. Yishpot aniei am yoshia l'vnei evyon v'yidake o'she. Yirauch ha'im shamesh v'lifnei yareach dor dorim. Yered kematar al gez kirvivim zarzif aretz. יפרח בימיו צדיק ורוב שלום עד בלי ירח, וירד מים עד ים ומנער עד אספי ארץ. לפניו יכרעו ציים ואויביו עפר ילחיכו. מלכי תרשיש ואיים ממך ישיבו, מלכי שבע ושבע אשכר יקריבו, וישתחוו לו כל מלכים, כל גויים יעבדו. כי יציל אביון משווע ועני ואין עוזר לו. יחוס על דל ואביון ונפשות אביונים יושיע. מתוך ומי חמס יגאל נפשם ויקר דמם בעיניו. ויחי ויתן לו מזהב שבע ויתפלל בעדו תמיד כל היום יברכנו. יהי פיסת בר בארץ בראש הרים ירעש כלבנון פריו ויציצו מאיר כעשב הארץ. יהי שמו לעולם לפני שמש ינון שמו, ויתברכו בו כל גויים יאשרוהו. ברוך אדוני אלוהים אלוהי ישראל עושה נפלאות לבדו, וברוך שם כבודו לעולם, וימלא כבודו את כל הארץ, אמן ואמן, כלו תפילות דוד בן ישי. We have a mizmor, which tells about the legacy of King David for his son. Please pay attention that at the end it says, that's the end of all the prayers of King David. So this mizmor is by King David, because here is the end of his prayer. But the title of the prayer is Lishlomo. So Lishlomo is for sure not written by Shlomo, because it is by King David, as we say at the end. So Lishlomo is for Shlomo. It is dedicated, it is the legacy of King David for David. If that is true and so evident for 72, we should take this observation for all future Mizmorim, the next 18 dedicated to Le David, but they are not necessarily written by Shlomo, by King David, as in the first two books, they might be written for King David. Li Shlomo, 
Le David can say he is the author or he, the order Mismo is dedicated to. Now let's take a closer look at the structure of this Mismo. And a lot of older commentators, the critical one, said very repetitive Mismo. The same idea over and over and over. Be a good king, do justice and take care for the poor people and do that again and again and again and again. And other kings will come and they will praise you and be a good guy for the poor people. It's all repetitive and has influences from other sources. The observation that there are repetitions are true, but they are very, very intended. And there are beautiful, uh, fine observations which I want to present you in order to show you the flow. At the beginning, he says, Hashem, give me the power, give me the blessing for the king, David prays, and give it also for my son, from Hashem to me. At the very end, when the king is successful and the, the, his nation praise him and other nations praise him, he says, oh, that is a big praise for Hashem. So there is an interaction in the Mizmor. It comes from Hashem, his appointment, his blessing. If he is successful, it goes back to Hashem. He is like a partner of Hashem. He is down on earth fulfilling what Hashem does in his kingdom in Bashamayim, al kiseh Hashem, King David does it, or King David wants his son Shlomo to fulfill that on earth and to bring back the bracha to Hashem. That is the idea that at the beginning and the end, a typical opening. In the middle, all nations come and he is powerful all over, a huge kingdom, and all nations come and respect him and uh, uh, respect him as Avadim. At the beginning and at the end, here, what you see here between 2 and uh, 7, and between 12 and 17, between these Mizmorim, there is something repetitive. Let's take a closer look, and we should understand this idea in more detail in a moment. What I do now on the, on the blue part is always, we have the structure, which I show here clearly. And now I want to show how one word makes a story, tells us a story along the mismo. It's a masterful piece, this mismo, with a lot of beautiful hints, if we look at that in this way. Lishlomo. The name is Shlomo, but the source of the name is Shalom. He brought peace in King David's life after the sin with Bathsheba. And Shlomo was born. Now he takes over his kingdom. And he should continue to bring peace to the world, Yisu Harim Shalom Lam, and to every ind individual. Yifrach beyamav tzadik, verof shalom ad bli yareach. That's the name is explained like a midrash. He does justice, mishpat. I want justice for the king, for his son, and he should do justice to his nation and all to the, to the poor. So justice will make, is the impact that he makes on his nation. Therefore, the tzaddik will thrive in his, during his kingdom. The tzaddik and justice is the same word. We have very beautiful connections here. The first three psukim focus three times. They focus three times on the nation. The king is here to serve the nation, to improve the nation, and to shape values for the nation. Everybody is part of them, including the poor ones. And here we have a beautiful combination that he asks, King David at the beginning asked for justice for him as a king and for his son as the, as the prince. But at the end, it's not for himself and for his son. He should make an impact for Malchei Tarshish, Malchei Shva. It's for all other kings. It's for not only for the Am Yisrael, a national bracha, it is a universal bracha. He brings tikkun olam. The same word is repeated. I cannot show all of them, but here is a very beautiful observation, which very much explains the repetition. At the beginning, he does justice to the Aniim. Yishpot am Yoshia Livnei Evion. But once all the kings came 
and they bring a lot of presents and gold and very special presents. I guess a lot of money and wealth. He gives this money to the poor. It's not that the king takes gold from his nation and he is the, the strong guy with all the, all the taxes for the king. The opposite is true. He functions for his nation. If at the beginning he does justice, in, in Pasuk uh, 12 and 13, the word evyon, ani, yoshia, is repeated. If at the beginning it was justice, at the end, it is not justice, it is at the end, it is charity. He cares for them. He is a social worker. He has empathy. And he talks about nafshot evyon, yigal nafsham. And he cares for them. He saves them. Not only justice, he prays for them. So the change from the first to the second part is very, very meaningful. It's like a, if you compare it in an analogy, if a doctor studies medicine, he has to know all the fields. But if he works afterwards, he has to apply it with a lot of empathy and a lot of care and a lot of personal attention. That's exactly the difference between the first part you do justice. That's the, the official job of the king. But if you did so, you have to show them that you actually care for your nation. It's much more here. So I cannot explain all these comparisons here, which are, I want to encourage you to look at them carefully. But what I want to point out at the end, kol hayom yevachenu, he praises them. He prays for his nation. He, he, uh, he gives them a bracha. And at the end, his name should be praised forever. And if that happens, all nations will praise him. He actually causes the praise of Hashem. If he is a successful king, his successful kingdom reflects right away on Hashem. That is actually a bracha. He is doing a kiddush Hashem as a king. Because he has a proper nation, there is justice. There are other nations which, who, who recognize him, who respect him. If he does that, he is a big bracha, a kiddush shem shamay, not only a kiddush shem of King David. That's a beautiful flow of this mizmor. I want to uh, explain now uh, a very, very interesting analogy. And there is a lot, writ a lot is written in particular in the uh, scientific literature about this mismo, comparing it to other systems of a king. And here we can take Hammurabi as a very good example. I have a lot of uh, good memories because once I mentioned Hammurabi when I was young and the first time I read about him, I was invited to an Orthodox family and they asked me to give it to Torah on, uh, on the, the parasha. And I spoke about Hammurabi and nobody had a clue who Hammurabi is. So I, I, I realized I'm in big, big trouble. So they asked me, who is that? Who is that? So I was, uh, had a siyat to the I tell them, oh, he is one of the Rishonim, a very old rabbi, a very old rabbi. He's called Hammurabi. And this way I was saved, but I didn't have to justify anything else. Hammurabi, lived in, in the 2000, uh, 1800 before the Kaminarium. And there is a lot, a lot of ideas that we can learn from there, Parshat Mishpatim and many, many, many other systems. But there is a huge difference. The king is appointed by God, so says Hammurabi, and he has to do exactly what he does, otherwise he is in trouble. Our Mismo says he's not only appointed, he can make kavod, for Hashem. The human being as a, as a king, and when he does justice, he can do a lot of good things for Hashem. And the Pasuk in Dibrei Yamim says that Shlomo was appointed, literally about King David says that, that he will sit al kiseh malchut Hashem al Yisrael. Vayeshev Shlomo al kiseh Hashem lemelech tachat David aviv. He is not only appointed and forced to do what God wants him to do, he is himself like a partner. He does something very special. We see in our Mizmo that at the beginning, King David asked for a bracha from Hashem, for the king and for his son. 
because of course he respects everything comes from Hashem, Baruch Hashem. But at the end of the Mizmor, he says, if we are successful, we make a big, big kavot le Kadesh Shem Shamayim on earth. So that is a huge difference that he uh, compared to Hammurabi. And of course, I refer to the literature where these issues are described in much more detail. But if this flow from the beginning of the Mizmo to the end of Mizmo is shown, we have a very nice example. Let's take the first Mizmo in the entire book. Now we talk about context, contextuality at the best. The first time Melech, the concept of kingdom is mentioned in chapter two, it says, all nations come and attack on Israel, but Hashem appoints the king, he appoints a king in Jerusalem. If that happens, he will lead all other nations to come to him. That's exactly in chapter two, the idea that all bad nations, all enemies, if they attack Am, Am Israel, they will, uh, the king of Am Israel will organize the world and will educate all kings, chapter two. At the very end of Sefer Tehillim, it says that King David doesn't talk about his kingdom. He talks about God's kingdom. Elohai HaMelech, Malchutcha Malchut Kol Olamim, Yim Loch Hashem Leolam Eloheich Zion, at the end of the book, Am Yisrael is happy, Bnei Zion, Yagilu B'Malkam. So he gives back the bracha, what he did as a king, along the entire book, and that is now the contextuality of the entire Sefer Tehillim. I am appointed as a king from Hashem, and I will make order on the world, and I will educate all nations, chapter two. And at the end, all nations will come and will recognize Hashem as the king. That's exactly the flow of the entire book. And it's exactly the flow of chapter 72. So it is a very, very good last will of King David in chapter 72, which is true for the structure of the entire book. That's the framework of Kol Sefer Tehilim, I think, as opposed to Hammurabi. Let's now look very briefly on the analogies on uh, in Sefer Tehilim. And that is a very, very full slide. I enjoyed tremendously over years to add all the analogies and all these comparisons to the text. I know such a slide, not, not only with two analogies, when it gets full, is very threatening and one can get dizzy. So what I suggest to do here is the following that I would like to enlarge it a little bit and show you some beautiful insights here. In chapter 72, King David is supposed, tells his son, do justice to all poor people. In chapter 68 and 69 and 70, King David says, I was once poor. When I started my career, the old man tells his story, his life story. If he says, I was poor, he tells his son, please take care of the poor. And he says, I want to see your justice, Hashem. And he says, his son, please fulfill justice. And these are the same ideas which are so amazing. Karva el nafshi ge'alah, he says in 69. You helped me and saved my soul. Ge'alah, nefesh ge'alah. And he says, king, please. You should be a goel, you should save all poor people. It's really a beautiful test, uh, a beautiful uh, last will of King David. Whatever happened to me, I want you to do for others. And that is the analogy which I have in red is the contextuality. The analogies which I have here in the slide, yes, it's very, very full. Uh, I, I brought it to the maximum, which I, what I could include, of course, I understand it's very threatening. You should print it out and take an hour or two to read all these psukim and Tanakh and to see how wonderfully amazingly uh, chapter 72 integrated all these psukim in this mismo. It quotes about King David that when he uh, went uh, uh, about Shlomo, when he was appointed as a king, he had the dream in Giv'on and he was dreaming and asking Hashem, give me a heart to do justice. That is what Shlomo did in Sefer Melachim. That's exactly what King David told him here. 
And we have the same words here repeated. And I want to show you very interesting analogies, which I think are really a commentary. The term that he should be king from sea to sea, ad asfei aretz, veyerd miyam ad yam, uminahar ad asfei aretz, and all nations will respect him. This idea is mentioned in Micha at the end of the first temple period, and it's mentioned in Zechariah. So the idea of the prophets at the end of the first temple period and at the beginning of the second temple period was quoting, he should be a powerful king on all other nations on the world. He should make an impact on the entire world, not only for Am Yisrael. That is the dream of the prophets in the end of the first temple period and at the beginning of the second temple period. That's what King David asks his son to be. So obviously, these ideas that King David tells his son are valid for his son, for the first temple period, and for the second temple period. They are a long-standing tradition if he does that. I cannot show you all the other analogies. They are from Yeshayahu, from Yirmiyahu, and from Yechezkel. But I would like to show you one very, very special one. At the end of the Mizmor, it says, kol goyim. All nations should have a bracha with Am Yisrael. That's what the last words are in chapter 72. It's a mistake. It's in Mizmor in verse 17, just at the end. If he says that to Am Yisrael, that the king should be a blessing for all nations, he is quoting what was told, what Avraham was told in Sefer Breshit at the very beginning, what Yaakov was told by Hashem and what Yaakov was told. You should be a bracha for all nations. And here we have quite an interesting insight that if we have this mizmor where it talks about King's, King David's success, it's not about the success of King David. It is that he should bring the whole, the legacy, the blessing, which Hashem gave to the fathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, he should fulfill that. So if you look at all these analogies here, there will be beautiful insight of each of them, and I have to keep it short and look forward, and, look and, and, and move forward to the next topic. So far, we saw that King David packed all his brachot to his son. He took everything from Avraham, from Moshe, Yeshayahu, Yirmiyahu, Yechezkel, everything. That's the highlight of his life, that he can give over his kingdom to his, to his son. Big hope. And afterwards, it says, Kolut filot David ben Yishai. And the contextual interpretation has a beautiful insight here. If he appears later on, classical commentators have a very hard time to explain it. Why all of a sudden is he still alive? He just died. Doesn't make sense and people give up. Contextual interpretation says, oh, it just said, Kolut filot David ben Yishai. Look at the next chapter in the third book, chapter 86. Without reading the pasuk, you see how many words are mentioned twice. You see, we just said, kolut filot David ben Yishai, it's the end of all the prayers. No, it's not the end. King David died. He's not around anymore. No, it's not true. He keeps davening. He keeps praying. Next time he is mentioned in chapter three, in the third book, only once. It just starts with Tfilah le David. I'm a poor man. He is a poor man. His son should have taken care for poor people. No, now King David, he is the poor man. And he is one of the nation, he is one of the population who prays, who takes care, who wants that all nations come. So he is the carrier of the ideas which King David gave, gave, all, gave over to his son. In the third book, in the memories of King David, somebody is praying the prayer dedicated to King David, which exactly the same, not, 
not the whole text, but really very, very much the same words, kol goyim v'yishtachavu v'achavda shimcha la'olam. It's the only chapter in, in the third book, 86, which is dedicated to King David. He continues to live in the memory of the nation afterwards. It's worthwhile to read these mizmor and to see how he starts over. The same effect we have in chapter 101 and 103. King David keeps living for the next generation. Here he is quoted in chapter 86. He calls himself Evit. He calls Hashem seven times Adonai. Chaneini Adonai ki alecha kol ayom. And he wants to be again a servant of Hashem. He wants to, re to start from scratch. Yes, King David died. But I want to follow King David's footstep. I keep praying. The same way King David prayed. Zichonoli bracha. He lives in my memory. I keep praying all my life the way he prayed. And you will see it has the same topic. All nations should come and they should worship Hashem and respect Hashem. And I will bring kavot, honor, shimcha le'olam. That's a beautiful connection, which is so meaningful because it really repeats it. And here I want to show you, we discussed in the lecture today, the second book. And I want to show you another fascinating example. In the second book, I told you in this uh, graphic presentation, which you see here from chapter uh, 51 to 72, the second David collection, there are two Mizmorim where King David says, I have to survive, I have to fight against my enemies. That's his lifetime. And these two Mizmorim, 72 and 60, they are repeated in 72 and 60. They are repeated in chapter 108. That is very, very surprising. If he prayed in chapter 70, 57 and 60, he wanted to fight and survive. Why is that repeated in the fifth book? Quite at the beginning of the fifth book. Why to repeat Mizmoi? Why do we need this, this uh, doppelganger, the repetition, the duplicate? Why do we need that? So Mefoshim explained what they tried to explain. That isn't the past, it's in the future. The, the critical commentator says it's a mistake. We know we, we don't have to repeat it. Let's take a look what we have in 57 and what we have in 60 on the right side. What is in gray is the same text. And what is in white, white are small minor changes, which I cannot explain. But we see that chapter 72, 70. 57 and 60, they have a long introduction. When did King David say what he said? He was running away from Shaul. And the other time he was just fighting with Aram Naharaim and another king. And he was in another uh, war involved. And it says Selah. And here it says Selah. Chapter 108, when Am Yisrael comes back from the exile, the fifth book, what do they do? They need a role model. They need a role model and they take the big, big hero from the first temple period and they know for a good reason to take chapter 57 and chapter 60. That is where the King David had to prove himself. He's fighting for Am Yisrael. He will not give up. They repeat that. It's a new Exodus. It's a new King David. And they repeat it. But in the Mizmo 108, all the biographical notes about King David, it happens when he was running away from Shaul. What we have here does not appear. Chapter 60, he said that when he was fighting in the war again, Aram Naharaim, not one word. Why? Because now it's rewritten. We are all little King Davids. We are all little kings. Chapter 108. We want to know his legacy and we want to continue. So please delete the historical identification with David at his lifetime. Just take the prayer. And the same way King David prayed in the first temple period, chapter 108 quotes when they come back to the city of David from the exile, they quote him, but not all the details. That is his history. It's our history. And the Sela in between just shows 
that these two pieces can be read uh, independently. So that is a wonderful example where the, the commentators explain that and Senga Hosfeld, the great researchers I learned so much from, they call it in, the, in their book, in their, in their commentary, they call chapter 108, Alt Neuland. It's the old new city land, of course, quoting Herzl, Alt Neuland, Tel Aviv. They are quoting what happened in the past will happen now in the future, and we continue King David. That's by intention that King David is quoted again with some beautiful differences we cannot elaborate now. So I summarize that we have the story of King David in the second book came to an end. Asaf will continue. And we remember that was the way it was in the Beit HaMikdash is also the Zitz im Leben, is also the Zitz in the Literatur. That's the way the book is structured because it is a clear, beautiful, well, well, it's a very intelligent structure of the book. The, the, the singers continue after King David died, they continue to sing his songs. It's again repeating here what we saw before. And I just want to point out here below, if you have time to read after chapter 72, to read how does King David continue his career after his death, his beautiful career, you should, I recommend you should read chapter 68, 86, 101, 103, 108, 110 in one flow. At the end, the last Mizmor says, Tehillah le David. It is the big Hallel for David, and the entire world starts the last Hallel. King David keeps leading them after his death in a wonderful career. So that was the shiur for today. Uh, we talk, we summarized the second collection of King David. We sh I tried to show that Mizmor 72 summarizes all the history, all the, the, the past experience of his own life, collection two, of many, many, many values in his life, which are related to Sefer Shmuel, which are related to so many quotations from, the, from other books of the Bible. And he leaves that as a legacy, as a last will for his son, but for the entire world. He wants that not only for his son, he wants that for all generations to come. We saw in the book that that continues. Next time, we will start the uh, Asaf collection, which is very, very a world on its own. And I want to focus on the center of the Asaf, the second Asaf collection, which is chapter 77 and to 79. There are a beautiful unit of three Mizmorim. There are not only the center of Asaf, second collection, there are the center of the entire book of Sefer Tehilim. There are a turning point and they have a, their own world and we should see that they are actually the beginning of the exile, but also the, 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 the features which should help Am Yisrael to survive the exile and to come back in the second temple period to rebuild King David's uh, tradition. So far for today, we summarized that we looked at the collection and the structure of D1, D2, and Mismo. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to hear your comments. Hi, uh, uh, Dr. Benny. Yes, there was a question by Molly. She said that um, since uh, Ms. Moore 72 is attributed to David in his lifetime, so how does that um, work with saying that uh, Yeshayahu, um, did Yeshayahu quote him? Like the quoting between Yeshayahu and, he, and, and David Amelech, um, how does that now work when we said that they, you know, Tehillim was edited? Like how do you put together uh, Ms. Moore 72 being attributed to David Melech, and yet you had said in the past that um, he took from Yesha, the, the editor of Tehillim took from Yeshayahu, which was after the time of David Melech. Good question. And of course, 
if we have the classical understanding that King David wrote the entire book, there is no other true, no other way to say that King that Yeshayahu, all the Nevi'im took from him because he is the author. He lived in the first temple period, and everybody wherever we have uh, analogy, they took from there. So that is the classical, let's call it the classical traditional approach. I do think that uh, for King Day to understand Sefer Tehilim, as we pointed out, there is a lot, a lot, a lot in the second temple period. If there is a lot from the second temple period, for instance, Beshu Vashem Shivat Zion, Al Naharot Bavel, 137, Shu Vashem Shivat Zion, 126. Obviously, the text was written at the time uh, later on, but King David keeps living ideologically. So, from my perspective, it is like I explained last time or two weeks ago, it is like having a nice play of Hamlet. But if, it is, if the play is in, 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 in 2020, there might be a microphone and there might be electricity, which did what was not a few hundred years ago. So, of course, the idea David HaMelech presents the legacy of his kingdom to his, to his son is the legacy he sees it in his time. In his time, he wants to have the legacy of King David for the all next generations to come. He quotes Yeshayahu, Yirmiyahu, Yechezkel. It's a big discussion who quotes who, but the Hebrew in Tehillim has a lot of features which are typically later, a lot of terms which are later. Ashrei She'el Yaakov Be'ezro. Ashrei She is not classical old style Hebrew from the first temple period. It is a later, a later style of Hebrew. We have classical terms which relate to a later period. So it makes more sense to say, as the Midrash says, that uh, Ezra, he wrote Sefer Tehillim, based on King David, inspired by King David. Would King David have known Yeshayahu, Yerbiyahu, and Yechezkel, he would have quoted him. Of course, with the chronological rule, we don't understand it because chronologically King David was his period. But please look at what we saw on chapters 51 and 52. If, and I think that's the only explanation which is so beautiful, the, the, the chrono, the, the flow in Sefer Tehilim does not follow chrono chronological historical events. Because King David, when he made his sin, he had to remember where did you start off? Why are you king? How did you start your career? As Nathan tells him. So 52 continues, Bevo elav kasher ba el, el adomi. So it is for sure not a historical chronological criteria, but it is a very powerful rule. You remember things. If King David in the second temple period is remembered that he will build the way that he lived in the first temple period, what we say in all the Nevi'im. So he integrates the Nevi'im because the Nevi'im say, King David will come back. His legacy will continue. So of course he quotes them. That is, I think, it's. A, I'm happy you point that out. That is a critical switch. How to understand Sefer Tehillim? I think, in the proper way, and everything gets so clear, and so meaningful. King David lives. He lives in the next generation. He has the he has the tradition and the legacy from old King David in the in the where is it here in the first temple period. And he continues here. Now you see the background. Does that explain the point? I know it is a people are not used to read Sefer Tehillim this way, and therefore it keeps causing uh, questions and, and uh, surprises. But if once we understand that, it is so much the entire the, the idea and the message of the Bible. Yeshayahu says King David will come back. Now he comes back. Let's listen again to King David. What would he have said in the second temple period to his son? That's the kind of the kingdom he wants for his son. Wow, it's exactly Zechariah 9, the same words. Okay. Very good, thank you. That was a very uh, thorough explanation. 
really appreciate it. Um, there were no further questions, really. Only Viv is asking if um, if we're having class next week. Wait, I had a question also. Uh, okay, sure. Sorry, I missed that. That's okay. I, I didn't understand why you always say Asfei Aretz instead of Afsei Aretz. I feel like you're doing it intentionally. Afsei Aretz, no. There are psukim where it says Asfei Aretz. It, uh, if I said here Asfei, it should be Afsei. Thanks for pointing out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think uh, there is class next week. You asked if they if we have class next week. The topic will be Mizmore Asaf, and which is seventy three to eighty three. These are very very challenging Mizmorim. A beautiful world of Sefer Tehillim. It's like a world on its own. And I would, there are some of them are very difficult, hard to understand. And I would like to focus on the, on the history of Neasa, 77, 78, 79 in the next shiur. And I would like to focus in the shiur afterwards, 14, on other Mizmorim of Asaf, including analogies to Sefer Yeshayahu and Echa. So if you have time to focus on these uh, 73, 83 Mizmorim, 10 Mizmorim, I hope that will be a good preparation for our uh, next shiur. Chapter 78 is the, not the longest, the second longest Mizmor in the entire book. It's a relative easy one. So it's worthwhile to read the 78 with the two adjacent Mizmorim and try to find what is according to the contextual interpretation, the connection, the connection is actually fantastic as it will show next time. Excellent, thank you so much Rabbi Benny and thank you so much everyone for joining and Chag Chanukah uh, Sameach, everyone should enjoy, enjoy a healthy and happy Chanukah. Thank you very much Chag Sameach, uh, thank, you. thank you Susan. Thank you, Chanukah Sameach. <laughs> Okay.